Hello, I'm Sandy Brownlee, and this is some joint work with Jason Adair, Simon Haraldson, and an MSc student of ours last year, John Jabo, and we're all at the University of Stirling in Scotland. The talk follows a pretty standard outline. I'll set out our motivation and what we were seeking to find out before going into the methodology. So in this case, the machine learning models, uh, hyperparameters, data and measurements that we were making. And then I'll go into experimental results before we stray into some search based optimization towards the end. So what's this all about? Well, Typically, if we were applying machine learning to a given problem, we would look at a few different models and we would tune their hyperparameters in order to get the most accurate model. And that's usually where the focus lies. It's getting the most accurate model, the one with the lowest error rate on some unseen test data. Um, but there are problems at the extremes of scale, right? That's, um, and the actual training and the, the application of the model consume electricity. Um, and we know that data centers are big consumers of electricity. Training a large deep learning model as a result produces a lot of CO2. And at the other end of the scale, on embedded devices, remote sensors, mobile devices, we're trying to minimize the, the energy footprint as much as possible to, to make use of the limited resources that, that are available. And we've got a real opportunity here. So with typical genetic improvement applications, we've got a target application that we're trying to speed up or make more energy efficient. But ultimately, we're doing that in the context of trying to retain functionality still. And functionality is, is quite um, coarse grained. You either pass the tests or you don't. But with machine learning, our functionality measure is accuracy. It's on a, a fairly continuous scale. So there's an opportunity here for us to be able to trade off accuracy um, in return for, uh, for getting an improvement in energy efficiency or runtime. I've done a little bit of work on this topic in the past, um, published in the paper that you can see there, uh, where we looked at a limited number of hyperparameters um, for a multi-layer perceptron, we found a couple of interesting things. One was if we plot all of the hyperparameter configurations in terms of error rate and energy, um, we were able to actually do quite well in both low error and low energy consumption. Um, but the relationship between the hyperparameters and energy consumption was a fairly complicated one. So over on the right, you can see as hidden layer size goes up, um, the energy goes all over the place. So we wanted to find out a little bit more about what's going on. So in this study, then, we formulated five questions that we really wanted to answer. And um, the first one was just whether there is a trade off between energy efficiency and accuracy, whether we've got something like the um, cartoon plot that I've given there where we go from low energy, low accuracy to high energy, high accuracy, and we're able to kind of walk along that trade off. And then kind of digging a bit deeper, what are the factors that drive that trade off? Um, is there a difference in those factors between energy for training and for inference? Um, can we spend more energy training for more efficient inference? That'd be really helpful for things like embedded devices or remote sensors, mobile devices, where we want very efficient inference with the final model. We might be able to invest a lot of effort in, in training that model before it's deployed uh, to get that. Um, and can we uh, make this uh, hyperparameter search more efficient by using search based optimization? The approach that we took was fairly straightforward. We're using um, the MLP classifier in scikit-learn and applying hyperparameter tuning to it for the hyperparameters that I've listed there. A mixture of structural ones, things like hidden layer size and the activation function that's being used in the neurons, um, as well as non-structural things like the solver, the, the training algorithm that's being used to fit the model. And we applied it to a mixture of UCI data sets, common benchmarks, um, and a much larger data set this mortgage data set from Kaggle. Our experiments covered a number of different measures and the full set of results are available at a link uh, in the paper and at the end of the presentation. Uh, in this talk, I'll be focusing on um, accuracy uh, on test data and energy for training and inference. Um, but the things that we measured overall were test accuracies, that is accuracy of the model on an unseen test set, the five-fold cross-validation accuracy of the model, the energy consumption, um, 
of the CPU while the model was being trained, and that was measured using PyRapple, which is a Python library for accessing the instructions on Intel CPUs that can approximate energy consumption for a given process. The CPU time and wall clock time taken for the training process measured using the Python functions listed there. And the energy and times for inference, that is application of the model, to test data a thousand times. And the reason that we repeat that a thousand times is basically to make the numbers big enough uh, to be easy to measure um, and also to replicate the idea that the, the model has, is being applied to new data repeatedly. Um, the training and test runs were repeated 30 times into leave, so that means for each we will go through each of the configurations once and then repeat each of the configurations again and so on for each of 30 repeats. Um, that's so that the random variation, random noise in energy and time measurements would impact each of the um, configurations roughly evenly uh, to try and counteract some of that noise. Um, and we report median and interquartile range because the um, as you can see, uh, that histogram there shows the energy measurements for 30 repeats of one configuration and the distribution is definitely not normal. You might be wondering why we're not just using CPU time as a proxy for energy and anyone who's done energy measurement will know that the relationship isn't as straightforward as that. Um, this for, is for all configurations on a particular day set, the CPU time versus CPU energy. Uh, and you can see that although there is overall a bit of a linear trend there, there's a lot of other things going on too. The bulk of our experiments were in a grid search experiment. That's an exhaustive search over all the possible hyperparameter combinations uh, within specified ranges. And for the UCI data sets, these were quite quick running. So we looked at a little over 1400 configurations. And for the mortgage data, that was a bit longer running. So we limited that to 72 configurations. And the plots I'm showing you here are the pre to optimal solutions. So these are the ones for which we can't do better in both energy and accuracy. Um, and we can see that there are very clear trade-offs. So the one on the left is the training energy versus the test accuracy for the mortgage data. And you see at the high end, uh, at the high accuracy end of the results, we've got this, this solution here, which is quite high accuracy, but we can drop something like uh, a third of the energy consumption of that while only losing a little bit of accuracy here, something like, um, about half a percent accuracy drop off there, um, but a massive reduction in energy. The plot on the right is on the glass data set and it is inference energy versus accuracy on test data. And we see the same kind of thing. So we've got a very high energy, high accuracy model, but we can drop two thirds of the energy here. Um, and we've um, only dropped uh, something like three or four percent of the accuracy. The next part of the study was a deeper dig into what was driving the trade-off between energy and accuracy. So we created a lot of visualizations like this one, where we have each row being a hyperparameter configuration from the Pareto front, and the columns being features um, and the energy and accuracy. So we're able to draw out any patterns, um, things like um, in this particular one, logistic regression seems to be appearing at the high energy, high accuracy end of the trade-off. To briefly summarize the results, um, for the test accuracy versus training energy, uh, we found that activation function seemed to have a bit of an impact on the trade-off. So quite often the tan h function would appear at the high energy, high accuracy end of the, the trade-offs. Hidden layer size, you might have expected to have quite a strong relationship with energy too, because as you have more neurons in the model, it consumes more energy and it can encode more information. And that was definitely the case for the glass data set. But actually um, on the other data sets, there wasn't a particularly strong pattern there, similar to that earlier work that I, I highlighted before. Um, the solver, that definitely makes a difference. Um, 
this makes uh, this is no surprise, right? The algorithm that's used for training the network will have an impact on the energy consumption during the training process and the accuracy of the final model. Um, but we also saw this quite interesting connection where sometimes you're able to get a higher accuracy model with uh, by combining a smaller hidden layer size and a longer training run. So it was still high energy uh, for the training, but the model will be much smaller, less complicated. So um, perhaps, um, could be lower energy consumption for inference um, and that there is a, a possible route to being able to invest a lot of energy in the training stage but have a, a more efficient lightweight model for inference for say a, a remote or a mobile device um, looking at the trade-offs for test accuracy versus inference energy um, very clear pattern there um, as the hidden layer size increases more neurons we have higher energy cost for inference um, and the interesting result there is that the solver still sometimes makes uh, a bit of a, a difference um, sometimes we were finding the atom solver was at the low energy low accuracy end of the the trade-off um, for inference so is, is there a difference in these factors between energy for training and inference well yes there definitely is I've mentioned a couple of times now this idea that we might invest more energy in training in order to get a, a saving in inference. Uh, so what we did was we tried plotting for all of the configurations on a given data set, the CPU energy for training versus the CPU energy for testing, that is inference. And what we can see here is that there is quite a broad spread, um, although there is loosely a positive correlation between the two. So that's sought after, um, trade-off um, doesn't really appear to be coming through. If we dig in a little deeper and filter those results for um, the higher accuracy configurations, um, we can actually see, um, so these are the lighter colored ones, are the, the high accuracy ones, um, the configurations around this area here are both low energy for uh, training and relatively low energy for inference and we don't seem to be able to do much better than those in terms of accuracy um, so there isn't really as much of a trade-off as we we might have hoped here all the results I've presented so far have been using a grid search that is an exhaustive exploration of the space and I think most of the people in the audience will recognize that we can maybe be more efficient than that by using some kind of stochastic search method. So we tried looking at applying NSGA2 um, to the same hyperparameter searches. Um, we just used the default configuration of NSGA2 from JMetalPy, um, but we quite, quite tightly restricted its runtime. So we limited it to a population size of eight and 240 function evaluations. That's about a sixth of the total search space um, because in practice, if we were going to let it run for much longer, we'd just do the grid search and be guaranteed that we'd find the, the global Pareto front. Um, the objectives for the, the run were test accuracy versus median training energy over 30 repeats of the, the training process. And the, the plot over on the right shows the results for one data set. Um, and we repeated NSGA2 30 times in order to get a range of Pareto fronts. So what we can see in the, the plot, the, the dots are the configurations from the grid search, the exhaustive search, and then the line shows the, the range of runs from NSGA2. Um, the black line is the, the median Pareto front. This is the area that was reached by um, at least half of the runs of NSGA2. And then the shaded area around it are the, the minimal and maximal Pareto fronts. The, basically the, the one that was reached by the best uh, runs of NSGA2 and the, the worst. And you can see there that actually we're, we're getting close to the um, global Pareto front, but uh, just missing out on it slightly. So there is some, certainly some potential here for uh, a search method like an SGA2. So to briefly summarize, uh, we've identified that there was a clear trade-off of energy versus accuracy, at least for the models and the data sets that we explored. And you might exploit that in one case by dropping only about a percent in terms of accuracy uh, to save over three quarters of the energy consumption. Um, we found that both structural and non-structural hyperparameters drive this trade-off. So as well as things like hidden layer size, um, 
the training algorithm, the activation functions, these all make some kind of an impact on the trade-off. Uh, we showed that a search-based approach like an SGA2 can approximate this trade-off fairly well with m far fewer evaluations than a grid search. Um, and of course, there is plenty more to do. Um, we would certainly like to generalize it, look at other model types, random forests, um, regression models, etc. Um, look at other har hardware architectures, other data sets, and a deeper exploration of the hyperparameters that drive the trade-offs. There's uh, certainly more on this question of trading versus inference energy. Uh, full results are at the link there, which is also in the paper, and you can reach me at that email address. Thank you very much for your time, and I now invite questions.